thank you akka for calling me special lady it make, makes me feel very special uh, but uh, thank i first thank god for giving me this opportunity and for choosing me and i also thank the church at large for giving me this opportunity to stand here um okay, at when uh, josh lakka asked me if i was willing to share i was as usual very reluctant but then i did agree eventually because this is a god given opportunity and i thank god for his opportunity and uh, the title that i have chosen is beauty barrenness ugliness and true blessing so this is an outline or a summary of a book that i had read about 6 years ago and uh, this book is written by anand mahadevan from his book the grace of god and the flaws of men so this is uh, though the book contains outlines of many characters i have chosen three patriarchal women uh, for our study and since it's women's day i thought uh, just understanding how god chose women how god transformed these women is something that i thought i will just share from out of the book so i want us to see these three patriarchal women uh, like before and after scenarios how they were before and how they were after being transformed so first i would like to start with sarah and let's see sarah in genesis chapter 16 verses 5 to 6 then sarai said to her abram you are responsible for the wrong i am suffering i put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant she despises me may the lord judge between you and me your slave is in your hands abram said do with her whatever you think best then sarai mistreated hagar so she fled from her in this passage we see sarah was blaming her husband she was the one who made the decision to uh, have children Uh, with her maid servant hagar but then when she found that hagar was pregnant sarah despised hagar and she turns around blaming abraham this is a pattern which we see that began in first creation the first uh, time when god had asked uh, adam what have you done so this is a very pattern this is a pattern that exist with all of us we all blame each other or somebody else for the mistakes that we we do what do you think about sarah is she setting an example of word is she a woman of word but in peter first peter chapter 3 verses 3 to 6 uh, paul writes your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes rather it should be that of your inner self the unfading beauty of gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in god's sight for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in god used to adorn themselves they submitted themselves to their own husbands like sarah who obeyed abraham and called him her lord you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear in this passage we see paul is telling about sarah who turned out to be having a person of unfading beauty with gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in god's sight the same woman who once blamed her husband now is a woman of grace she was so submissive and she is recognized in the bible for her worth which is more acceptable in god's sight that is she has an unfading beauty of gentle and quiet spirit let's see sarah sarah was so beautiful all of us would like to have that beauty even at the age of 65 she was followed by two men so many times i think about when i see my friends i'll be like wow they are able to have two three boyfriends while well, i can't even have one 
<laughs> so Sarah at the age of 65, she was able to, uh, she had kings who, who were actually wooing her, who wanted to marry her. And everywhere she went, her, the news of her beauty went viral. So, but in spite of that, Sarah was barren. The Bible tells that in Abraham's household, there were about 300 trained men who were born in his household. That means through her lifespan, Sarah was always hearing news about somebody giving birth. <laughs> so Sarah must have felt very awful. That's how I also feel sometimes when I hear a lot of my friends getting married and I'm still here. That was way back then, now I'm very good. <laughs> But that was, that was how it was and probably Sarah also felt that. Sarah was blessed with beauty but she also had barrenness and she was grieved by it. And she expressed her grief at least three times. One she said, Lord has, the Lord has kept me from having children. And she also she said to Abraham, you are responsible for my suffering. And the third time she said, get rid of that slave woman, for that woman will not share in the inheritance of my son Isaac. She complained. So when things don't go our way, we also turn bitter. We, we, we can't wait. We can't, uh, we can't wait and trust in the goodness of God. And the goodness that we experienced in the past also slowly fades away from our conscience. So in that process, we tend to attack people with our words, with our thoughts, and I'm very guilty of that. If some things don't turn my way, I'm already scheming words and actions in my mind of what to do, what next to do, how to retaliate, how to shout back. I'm very guilty of that. So we always brew bitterness in our hearts when things don't go our way. But in our culture, we are always vulnerable. We have beauty, we also may experience barrenness. Now when I'm talking about beauty, uh, we can have beauty in a different sense, a very good successful career, um, always being recognized by somebody around, maybe our dressing sense. There are a lot of things where we can have beauty and all of us want this kind of beauty. But we also tend to become barren when our lives are not a blessing. We become self-centered and we become bitter. But Peter here in 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 2 to 3, he's painting a picture of Sarah who is not acknowledged by her physical beauty, but she is recognized by her inner beauty, which is radiating much brighter than her physical beauty. And he described her inner beauty like that of a gentle and quiet spirit, and he describes it as very radiant. And he acknowledges that it is, wor it is worth, and God recognizes that worth. What a transformation. God brought about in her from physical beauty to inner beauty. Next, I would like to bring about into account of Rachel and Leah. I'm sure all of us, whenever we read about Rachel and Leah, we wonder or we must have wondered why should God create Rachel so beautiful and Leah so ugly because the Bible terms Leah as ugly. Wasn't God unfair? I'm sure this must be resonating with all our teens around here. We all go through that phase. I don't look good. Or maybe she's so beautiful. Wow. We all go through that phase. Think about this for a minute. Who would you want to be? Do you want to be Leah? Or do you want to be Rachel? Who do you think is more blessed? Who, who do you think is more likely to have a happier life? I'm sure we all want to be beautiful like Rachel. We want to have that beauty. Certainly be physical beauty is an asset. And I also think it is very relative because beauty changes over time. So a lot of people think uh, beauty was termed in one way in a certain period of time, but beauty has changed over a certain period of time. And 
all of us must have been like Leah at some times, unloved and rejected. Or we must have felt very ugly in our life. But who is a better judge of beauty? Humans or God? So the problems of the human heart are much deeper than physical beauty. Rachel had the love of Jacob and she desired children more than she desired God. Leah had children and she desired the love of Jacob more than she wanted God. Neither of them wanted God first. They wanted children or they wanted love of Jacob. And God deals with both the women very differently. I just want to go through that a little. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. So God was drawing Leah to himself by giving child after child. And God is drawing Rachel to himself by not giving her a child for a long time. God is drawing both Rachel and Leah to himself, but he's drawing them in two different ways. Let's see Leah. When her first son was born, she said, my husband will surely love me now. And then she had another son, second son. Now she says, the Lord heard that I am not loved. And so he gave me another son. The third son is born now. And Le Leah says, now at last, my husband will become attached to me. J Leah must have been thinking, if only Jacob loves me now, everything will be super perfect. But then Rachel was longing for her husband and she was having children. But nothing could change Jacob's attitude towards her. Leah did not have genuine love from her husband and it was pushing her to depression. She was longing to be loved, cherished by Jacob and she thought that was the ultimate in life. And she was praying to God only to receive that kind of love. What about us? Don't we use God for what we need? So many times I think if only I have this, it's so good. We use God just for our needs. Just like Leah, we also put God second. She wanted Jacob first and God second. So she ignored God, and, but yet God was gracious. He was attentive to her prayers and God gave her child after child. And when the fourth child came, everything changed. At the birth of her fourth son Judah, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. Thank God she said this. What changed? Let's see. While God was wooing Leah by giving her child after child, God was wooing Rachel by shutting her womb. She had one son and then it was done. Now she saw that Leah was having child after child and she offers her maid, maid servant to Jacob. Leah I feel sad for Leah. All her life she grew up ugly. She was not even looked upon by men, whereas Rachel, she was beautiful. Probably everybody was seeing her and Jacob also looked at her. Now, when Leah started having child after child, she doesn't believe that it was her credit. Now she looks to God and she sees this at grace and she gives back the credit to God. But Rachel, she got everything in her life. She had people following her. She, uh, I mean, she had a guy who married her and probably she was arrogant because she was beautiful and she must have thought, uh, I have everything. So, so Rachel had to wait before she could have another child. And this wait was absolutely necessary for her spiritual growth. She actually turned to Jacob first. And she became very jealous of Leah, seeing Leah have child after child. And she told Jacob, give me children or I'll die. She too was desperate. But then Bible tells us that God listened to Rachel as well. And now Rachel prayed 
and then God opened her womb. So we see that God listens to our prayers, but he makes us wait. Are we turning to God only when everything fails? Is God our first resort or our last resort? Or are we using God just to get things for us? God is patiently listening to us. He's seeing us what we are going through. And slowly and very tenderly, he changed the pain of both these women into a place where we can cherish. And we also see that God works and he answers. There is something that we can see somewhere in this. Who was the sadder of these two? Rachel or Leah? Whom does your heart go out to? Probably we might say Leah, some of us might say Rachel, depending on what situation we are in. But this is, I would want us to see something through the essence of the gospel. In the absolute worst period of her life, Leah experienced Jesus and more intimately than Rachel. Now how do we know that? Because when Leah had her fourth son, she said, I will praise the Lord. What changed for Leah? She was ugly, lonely, rejected, despised, unloved. What did the fourth son change? We don't know what had happened. We don't know what transformed within her, how she was transformed. But she said, now I will praise the Lord. God had promised Abraham a seed and that nations would be blessed. And that seed is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came through the seed of Judah for the son whom she praised God for. Figuratively, if you think, Leah actually carried Jesus in her womb as a seed. How does the story of Rachel and Leah end? Rachel died first. Sadly, she died giving birth to her second son, J Benjamin. Jacob was on a journey at that time. Jacob grieved for Rachel and he buried her. And it was in a lonely, undistinguished grave. Leah died many years later. Jacob buried her in a cave where Abraham and his wife Sarah, Isaac and his wife Rebecca were buried. Later, when the time came for Jacob to die, he called his 12 sons and instructed him to bury him next to Leah. Who would you rather be? Leah or Rachel? Is Sarah the ultimate portrait of the unfading beauty of gentle and quiet spirit is? No. But Jesus is. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, Paul writes, he committed no sin. Uh, sorry, Peter writes, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to judge himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. In th through this passage we see that Jesus had the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Sarah is not the ultimate, though Sarah is being recognized. It is wrong for Jesus to be slapped to be spat upon, to be stripped, to be beaten, and to be nailed. He did not deserve anything of that. Yet, he submitted to his father's will. He lived a very sinless life, the perfect life. And he willingly went to the cross as a sacrifice for us. And he took away the wrath. Was Leah very ugly? And so Jesus was also ugly. When Jesus was hanging upon the cross, he took on himself the ugliness of every dirty act that we might do. In our thoughts, 
in our words, in our deeds. And when Jesus was on the cross, and as God saw Jesus on that cross, he did not see Jesus as his son. He saw Jesus because of our sin. And Jesus took that upon himself, and he gives us his righteousness. So on the cross, Jesus became very ugly, so that for the rest of eternity, God can look at us beautifully. So Sarah went on from being the bitter, cruel woman who abused her maidservant, Hagar, to becoming a Christ-like woman. Leah went on from loneliness to an intimacy with Christ, and Rachel from sense-centeredness to Christ-centeredness. What must we do to be transformed? There's nothing. Just hold on to Jesus. When we hold on to Jesus, we experience the power of God that is salvation for everyone who believes. The salvation is completed only when we are fully transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And that will happen certainly when Jesus comes back again. And God will not rest till he has transformed each one of us into his image. May God transform us into his image and keep us safe till the day of his coming. Amen.